Welcome, my 296 subscribers, everyone who did not give up on AEW and are now reaping the rewards with how good the shows are, in ring wise, uh, not really in segments, as I'll talk about in this review for this episode of AEW Dynamite New Year's Smash for the December 28th show. Let's begin. Alright, so I'm working on this top 20 matches of the year video. But it sort of delayed just because of a couple of more matches this year that haven't taken place yet. Specifically two. It's the Death Triangle versus the Elite match number six. And Kazusada Higuchi versus Yuki Ueno. And my god, does Kazusada Higuchi show up on that list. So yeah, just giving you guys the heads up. Watch out for that video and it's probably gonna piss off majority of viewers. So yeah, for this show, we start off with Brian Danielson versus Ethan Page in a singles match. This had a buff in the form of MJF in the stands just like taunting Brian Danielson, which is I think uh, could have been extended to Ethan Page since they have like a connection with the firm. There should have been something between them. A mention of Ethan Page, maybe like some insults, would have been nice. It does make MJF seem a bit toothless because he was about to say something, I think. And then he holds back as Ethan Page is like making faces at him. But he does find the hottest girl in Colorado, so... But she's like a 7. So I guess MJF is buried. But yeah, for the match itself, it's a story of two halves. The first half is just like slow plotting made-for-TV stuff. Ethan Page moves like a tank. You can call it slow or methodical, but as someone who enjoys the faster, more exciting matches, this just went on too long for me. He did like minimal stuff, but he did great heel work, so it can be forgiven a bit. This match almost reached my limit of like people just lying down on the floor, but the second half was sufficiently action packed to my liking. Ethan Page's like power slams were just like a thing of beauty. One outside and then one avalanche one. They plod just a little too much. They like decrease the gear. But thankfully this was near the end and the match didn't go on for too long. I'm not a fan with the making fun of Stokely's baldness. They're giving him like a hat gimmick just like Jake Hager. But it's a lot more like mean spirited and just like incredibly low hanging fruit. Who cares if you're bald? Top three spots of the match is number three, Danielson slipping out of the razor's edge, going for the Busaiku knee, which sets up the finish. Number two is the power slam outside, and then number one is the avalanche power slam. Finish of the match is kind of underwhelming. It's just like an STF, a modified STF by Danielson, in where the second he locks it in, Paige just faints immediately. STF isn't even well applied. Terrible finish. But this was a fun opening match. Ethan Page is protected. And he actually performed well here despite just like slowing things down. He Peyton Mannings. Or like he Jose Mourinho's the game. Or the match to be more appropriate. TV main event, pay-per-view undercard match. Solid stuff. Next is the Wardlow vs. Samoa Joe buildup. Okay, so Joe is, I think, the right dude to walk away with the TNT title. And I'm glad that they had him win. Spoilers. Uh, he's just so good on the mic. He's also, like, decent in the ring. And Wardlow hasn't had the best TNT title run. He had good matches. Uh, the one at the main event is probably, like, number two or, like, just, like, bordering on number one for me. And I think they managed to protect him pretty well since he was about to cut a promo backstage. But he's attacked by Joe. And I think Wardlow put on a, like, a great acting performance. He continues this on the match later. And yeah, I think this is like the perfect way to have the feud move on. Just like move Wardlow up, 
have him feud with something else. Like, I think the TNT title cannot be built up more or, like, cannot be elevated more by Wardlow. He's done all he can, and that's vice versa. So, like, the TNT title cannot elevate him, like, any further. He should be going after the main title, like, even if he loses. Since his, like, rival MJF, the guy who he squashed, is now the champion. So I I think it makes sense if he starts going for that. And as for Joe, he's right where he belongs. He can cut decent promos. He can have, like, 15-minute max matches. He can get wins off of the younger wrestlers. And then he can put over the dude who takes the title off of him, like, hard enough. After this is the Hangman Page injury update promo. So his rival's wife, Renee Paquette, is the person interviewing him. And there should have been an interaction between the two. Uh, like a suggestion made by Suplex where he says that he should like promise to do the same to Mox in front of his wife. And just like mentioning Mox's kid would have been a nice touch. It would have certainly heated the feud up even more, but it might be too heelish for Hangman. And I think he works better as a babyface. Like, there is no world that Hangman Page can be a good heel. Like, not when he was in Bullet Club, not ever. Ever. He's a babyface for life. For life. But yeah, this was just a bog standard. Doctor tells him he should chill. And Paige struggles to chill. This does successfully make Paige an underdog. But this does not progress the feud at all. It's a lateral move pretty much. So yeah, after this is BCC versus Top Flight. This is pretty much the Darius Martin showcase. Since he felt like the protagonist of the match. He does all of the big moves. He is the whipping boy but he manages to dish out. So moves on his own. We see his like usual move set, like the whole breadth of it. And Dante doesn't do anything like to steal the show too much. I think this worked in making us care for Darius, since they give him the personality of being this dude who is win first, showboat later. Or just they make him a really focused, methodical dude. He's pretty much the Matt Hardy of the team. He's the guy who's used as a platform for Dante's moves. He's fundamentally sound. And he basically plays support while his brother does all the damage. But yeah, for this one, they managed to make Darius Martin look strong. He's the dude who opens the floodgates on Mox's injury. He works on that leg. And pretty much kayfabe takes Mox out of most of the match. Mox, on the other hand just shows up to work, becomes the whipping boy, sells pretty well, and contributes to the finish. But he didn't do anything like mind-blowing or spectacular in this one. Dante doesn't try to steal the show, and Claudio steals the show. Claudio, like in every match, is the best performer. Production does a bad job in setting up for the ending of the match. There's a death rider to Dante Martin that we don't see the full motion of. And it even happens on the outside, so it's a pretty hard bump to take. So shame on you, AW production team. So the finish is just like a hard European uppercut by Claudio for the win. Top three spots are, so number three is Darius's DDT off of Dante. It's like one of their signature tag team moves. I don't know their like finisher as a tag team. We'll see as like they face more like even teams. Like when they actually win. Maybe face them off against Brian Pillman and uh, Brock Anderson. That would be nice. But yeah, as for number two, the Mox pin breakup from their verse STO by uh, Darius Martin. And for the number one spot of the match, it's the big swing where Dante jumps over the rotations just to like close the gap between him and Claudio. So yeah, great feat of athleticism uh, that just adds to the match. So yeah, great match that I think helps Darius out a lot. Slowly and slowly, we start caring about this dude who's like injury prone, 
was out for most of the year and is now just like making his comeback. So yeah, hopefully things go well. He doesn't get injured again because he's starting to heat up. He's actually now the most important member of his team, even if Dante is like a phenom. So yeah, as for my match rating, it's a TV undercard, pay-per-view undercard match. It's alright. Not as good as the first one though. Especially because of this, like, I forgot to say, there's like this upkick in the match, but then Dante oversells it and then he like uh, gets launched outside even if it wasn't even a hard kick. So yeah. And then after this is the Orange Cassidy versus Kip Sabian uh, face-off, promo battle, whatever. So the outcome of this segment was not what I expected. This was some avant-garde shit that's right up my alley. So yeah, I like Kip Sabian's new gimmick. Uh, it's like sort of like a theatric plotter who rhymes what he says a lot. Uh, he tries to show off that he reads more books than you and I. But I'm sort of like... I mean, I mean like, I like it. I, I like the gimmick, but... I'm like 60-40 on it since this is like an American crowd that he's performing in front of. And I'm scared that this might not take off to them as it is to me. And it's not like the best gimmick ever. It's like pretty much mid-card. It locks you in the mid-card. Who will ever take someone seriously who like rhymes? Who's like actually putting on a performance? But I'm glad that Kip is shown on TV. He's one of the originals. He's still young, and I think there is potential in something there. So Kip boasts about how he eliminated Orange, but Trent successfully argues his way into a match against his friend, which Orange accepts. And this confuses Kip, but then he plots and schemes some more. So obviously Orange is going to beat Trent, and... Probably Kip as well. Since dude hasn't been built strong enough, he hasn't been on TV much. I mean, he's not featured prominently. He doesn't cut promos. I mean, this is probably the most we've seen on him, like on Dynamite. So I think this is a big chance for Kip as well to like establish himself, to show what he's got since he did it with uh, Pac in the pay-per-view that I forgot when. But yeah, he's facing off against Orange Cassidy, who's like guaranteed really good in the ring. Uh, promos, not much. But I think things work better if Kip does most of the talking. It's his gimmick. So yeah, this is a chance for him to show us what he's got. This can catapult him further up in the card. Win or lose. Just give us the great performance, like a great promo, and like that'll... Elevate you in the car just like it was with Ricky Starks. And yeah, ultimately, I think he fails against Orange, but he gets elevated by the end. So after this is the hook squash match that happens weekly. I didn't even notice the jobber this time, but yeah. Hook gets the biggest pop he does in months. Uh, He squashes the jobber, and I still maintain the stance that Making him mortal against like AEW regulars is like essential to his development. Since like he dominates these like jobbers always, and I don't think like especially his opponent in the feud, Big Bill, if Hook ever like takes him down, wins clean, that'll be a burial. Have him learn, have him lose. He's not used to fighting these like upper card people. Just don't have him squash everyone or like have him look stronger than everyone like that should not be the case with hook i think he should be mortal so we can get behind him more and then after the match the firm show up as well as jungle boy we have a great face-to-face encounter between bill and hook but they don't really touch much we have failed attempts at moves uh hook fails because big bill is just According to his namesake, Big. So yeah, so that's probably going to happen at like at the blow-off match itself, at the pay-per-view, whenever it happens. 
And as for Bill, he fails because of like assistance from Jungle Boy with that piece of wood. And I really wish like Hook was just taken out here. I know all the teenage girls that they are marketed to are going to be disappointed. But I mean, come on. I mean, Hook is so small compared to Big Bill. Bill's like 37. Hook's like 23 or something. Have him look mortal. If like Hook manages to like take out Big Bill, if it's like a squash just like the usual Hook match, if he doesn't struggle, like why are we even watching? But yeah, at least here, he has a lot of trouble against Bill. He's not used to the better competition. And he's just like a squasher of jobbers. He can't do it yet to the main roster. So I'm predicting just like this teenage heartthrob group to win out because I mean they are too over right now to fail they are more attractive to like the teenage audience if they want younger viewers then why not push these guys and you always have Lee Moriarty there to get pinned submitted whatever as one takes out Big Bill outside but the match dynamic should be like just a two-on-one in order to beat Bill. And they just managed to catch Lee, like by surprise, to win the match. Or you know what? An even better outcome to this is the firm managed to win with or without Christian Cage's like attempts to sabotage. So yeah, squash match, it's the usual hook match. As for the post-match segment, you could have just gone all the way. Just had Bill take out Hook. Have him be a threat. Make Hook mortal for fuck's sake. And then after this is the Jericho Ricky Starks sort of recap video followed by Jericho's promo. Uh, It's just a well-made highlight video, nothing really much. And as for Jericho's promo, it just sets up their match next week. It's a very run-of-the-mill Jericho-style promo. Nothing that progresses the feud much. Nothing that like catches the eye it's just like okay it's just plain water i don't like that the match is happening like right away next week i think it should be built up to the next pay-per-view because ricky's one of the new pillars versus one of your most famous stars i don't think dynamite is like the right place to pay this off i'm expecting uh something shenanigans i expect jericho to win Dude should not have lost to Action Andretti in the first place, even if it was a great moment. And yeah, hopefully Ricky Starks comes out of this a lot better than he is now. So after this is the follow-up to one of the worst segments in AEW history. And it's Mogul Affiliates with Swerve Strickland at the helm and his two unknowns. Parker Boudreau and this dude here. So some positives for this faction is that Swerve's boys look like they're killers, but the downside is they're green as fuck. I don't think they know the difference between a wrist lock and a wrist watch. I think they'd be better off in the WWE, where fans like optics more. But yeah, Swerve explains his actions all right, and then Wheeler Yuta out of nowhere just challenges him to a match on Rampage. So the match itself is probably going to be really good. But why? Why Wheeler? I guess the challenge is pretty entertaining. It gets oddly sexual. And yeah, that's it for this segment. Wheeler Yuta stole the show here by making that challenge sound more sexual than it should be. So after this is Death Triangle versus The Elite match number 6, False Count Anywhere. Okay, so I'm working on this like match of the year video, but I'm putting it on hold because I'm cramming all of like the most well-acclaimed matches throughout all the companies. Some examples are like some of the G1 matches, as well as Higuchi versus Ueno, that happens like I think tonight at time of recording. And there's also this one right here. So I was looking through social media, just like passing time to like a pretty benign day. And then I saw highlights to this match, namely the ending. And I knew I just had to like put off the whole list. This match is probably going to move some entries. And yeah, it does, but not the core top matches, thank God. 
So this is a bit like Stadium Stampede in the first half. And then it shifts back into the arena and then back into the ring for some of these people. They move around a lot. We get a tour of like this Colorado Stadium's backstage. The match actually starts backstage, which is something different from the other five matches before this. And yeah, this one successfully makes this whole series watchable again. So yeah, this starts off backstage. It's pretty much a backstage brawl. We get like a lot of wasting of food that I don't appreciate. You Americans are so decadent. Just using food for spots. Like at least give it to the homeless, give it to like third world countries. Not just like have it be like sprinkled all over the floor. All of the cookies, I think bagels were here too. As well as potato chips were just like wasted. That's heading straight to the trash. What I do appreciate though are the hold in place spots where two members hold like two members of the opposing team there and then the third member goes for the diving move. This is the only time the weight spot works. It's like 0% bother. Production was a bit inconsistent actually throughout the night, but this specific fuck up here where Nick pushes, I think, Pack, who's on like this crate, like a wheeled crate towards Matt for the super kick. Uh, production misses the super kick itself, but they manage to save it with this shot of like Pack on this wheeled crate going in an arching motion. Subtle comedic effect. And then when they get to the arena, that is when shit starts to just go crazy. In a span of four minutes from when they got to the arena. This cemented this match in my top 20. This is pretty much where like three of the top four spots of the match happen. Number four is this Tornillo dive from like the set on to like everyone. And then Kenny from I think one of the tunnels. I forgot it was healer face. But Kenny does a running V trigger. Fennec sells it with a flip. Number three is the deadlift German suplex to Kenny. With like a loud sound, loud thud. Dude should not be taking these moves. But it does get the This Is Awesome chant. And then number two, for the span of just four minutes, we have the Northern Light suplexes by Matt Jackson. Yes, Matt Jackson gets number two spot of the match. It's like Northern Light suplexes all throughout the entrance ramp until they make it to ringside. It starts with just pack, but then Phoenix likes pain, so he joins up for the last one. And then at the same time, Nick Jackson does like a somersault dive through the Northern Light suplex to get to pack. This and number one spot are very, very close. Match slows down. Death Triangle do this questionable spot where they provide Kenny with armor and then they dropkick him. But I guess if like the dropkicks are coming from all sides, it offers less protection. It actually works against you having this like trash can on top of you, I think. This has never happened to me before, so I wouldn't know. They basically overdo the match. I don't have any complaints for the match like in a vacuum, but when you compare it to other matches of the year, it's gonna rank in like 11 to 20. Everything, everywhere, all at once happens, and it gets as intense as the end of that movie. Yeah, you should go watch that one. That's like favorite for best picture. It's a high speed, high octane, balls to the wall match all over the arena. And people might discredit it by saying that there's no storytelling. But man, the way these guys kicked each other's asses is the fucking story. Oh, my tastes are too refined for this. Give me more wrist locks and head locks. And people just lying down on the floor doing nothing. The story, the story, the story. Real fights, real fights, real fights. And the finish is just so smart. It's like layers upon layers of depth. Because Pac has one of the Jacksons in the ring. He has him in the Brutalizer. He's expecting a tap out since there's no one there to help. I think it's Matt. Then little does he know that Kenny is in the crowd. He's in like the elevated top section of... I don't know what you call it. But yeah, like the mid-tier seats. He one-winged angels Phoenix on a bunch of tables. It's like an 8 to 10 feet drop. I'm not good with measurements. But yeah, he hits this. Pac obviously can't hear the count since there's no mic there. This is happening in another part of the arena. Kenny gets the three count. The bell is rung. 
and Pac thinks he won. So yeah, there can be no other score for this than pay-per-view main event level. I honestly don't know how they'll top this with a ladder match. It has to be something else. But thankfully, I don't have to wait for that in order to finish my top matches of the year list. So yeah. So after this is the music video by The Acclaimed. It's a much better song than what Sanjay Dutt did. It's a much better everything than that piece of shit. But I don't think it's as good as their first music video. It has a lot less kick. It's a bit monotonous. Words though are a bit more referential. And I think I can relate to more than the other one. But yeah, we get callbacks from Jeff Jarrett's career. But it's bookended in the end by the stealing Kurt Angle's wife line. The rap about Lethal, I think, is a lot more like facts. It hits, I think, Lethal more than the rap against Jarrett hit Jeff. It talks about the imitation gimmicks as well as losing to a 74-year-old Ric Flair. It's segment of the night in a night where segments aren't really the highlight of the show. Like all segments except for this one are pretty much just lateral moves, just like net zeros. And so after this is Ty JAS versus Ruby Soho and Willow Nightingale. So it's an uneasy alliance against a pretty well-oiled machine, but that machine is not uh, functioning its best. It's still well-oiled though. There's a clash of personalities between Ruby Soho and Willow Nightingale. And then for the other side, Anna J and Tay Mello get along like very well, but it's just their wrestling skills aren't on par with their opponents. One team is made out of like two of the best babyface workers in the company for different reasons. Ruby's that passionate underdog dramatic face while Willow is the one who appeals to kids. She has those big expressive movements that I think most people will get behind. She knows how to get a crowd behind her without giving us like a pity party. While Tay Mello knows how to fucking rile up a crowd. She's a heat magnet. She does it with her voice as well as just body language. Especially this one where they like shake their asses. But then Willow like counters it with an ass shake of her own. That's like top three spot of the match. Anna Jay is the whipping girl of her team. As she should be. Let's, let's like be fair here. But she's a lot more improved. A lot less awkward mover. And she can finally execute her moves better than how she did against Jade. Or like her last tag team match. But she's still just a little bit vanilla. She sort of forgets her character as she wrestles. So the heels cut the ring in half. They're pretty much like the ass boys in the women's division. They do very minimal like offense. A lot of just like hold away, keep away spots. Some rest holds and stuff. Not very exciting except for the heel work by Tay of course. But they managed to keep the crowd in the match unlike most women's matches this year. And I think the crowd really helped as well. They love the shit out of the show. From start to finish, this crowd I think helped this one be like above average. Latter part of the match surprisingly does not fall apart. Ruby and Willow's tag moves aren't very polished. They need to work on this. There's a bit of awkwardness to the timing and I really hate the moves with like the kick before one person executes like a singles move. It's like how Taya and her faction with Rosemary and that other girl are in impact. Number two spot is a pin breakup after a spike DDT by Tai on Ruby and then top one spot of the match is a headbutt by Tai but this takes both of them out and then Ruby falls on Ty to get the pin kick out. And as for the finish, it's a well-coordinated cheating scheme by Ty and Anna. So Anna picks up a chair, she distracts Aubrey Edwards, and Ty actually uses the chair against Ruby. But this is the part where it just like ends the match on a sour note because Ruby just holds the chair a little bit too long. Ty just wasn't like quite ready to do her pump kick yet. I think it's the fatigue from the match. It takes just a little bit too long for Ty to get off the kick. It looks a bit awkward, but she hits the pump kick on the chair, followed by the Ty KO for the win. So yeah, the match has a disappointing ending, but I think they did a good job in following up that banger match of the year quality candidate match before this. This gets a TV undercard, pay-per-view undercard match. Just a little bit to be TV main event. It's just that damn chair shot. 
And then after this is Lexinaire interviewing the ass boys. So Lexinaire just does not like these dudes. You can see it in her facial expressions, and that's some nice consistency because she did yell at them once. But since her boyfriend is like in the same faction, she just has to like take their shit. But this promo segment is just useless. Like just because FTR aren't in America, you don't need to have anything from their feud on TV. Or you could have just like went all in on it and had the ass boys celebrate like here or like on Rampage. But instead they hold it to like next week on Dynamite. Yeah, terrible useless segment. And then after this is the Ricky Starks promo that I think is a better promo than Jericho's. It's a lot more well put together, a lot better wording. I think it gets the fans more on Ricky Starks' side just because it's a lot less lateral than Jericho's promo. It sets up their match better, it heats up the feud. Just a much better promo. Number two segment of the night. And then for the main event, it's Samoa Joe versus Wardlow for the TNT Championship. So this is a rock and a hard place. The difficult task of moving Wardlow from this feud without absolutely ruining Joe. If anyone won clean here, that would have been absolutely disastrous for the loser. But I think they protected Wardlow well in defeat since Joe attacked him like early on in the show. And still, Wardlow like manages to put up a fight against Joe. Wardlow is delayed from his entrance. This gives time for Joe to just like shit on the Denver Broncos, which I think everyone should. And I'm not even an AFC West fan. Russ sucks and you ruined your team. Match itself is pretty fun. Wardlow looks very strong in defeat since he manages to like go toe to toe with Joe, even dominating him at some points. He consistently sells the leg. I would rate it about like eight out of 10. He does miss a few times at the start, but at the end, he just goes ham with it. This guy sold the shit out of that leg. 9 out of 10. The power moves in this match are just beautiful. That's what makes the match. And the part where Wardlow is thrown out and he just sells, we get like a doctor spot. And then we just have him going up back in the ring very slowly. When you do a slow ass match, this is one of the ways you make it more entertaining. You have shit like this happen. It's a bit too on the nose, a bit too hammered in, but I think you need that for those like denser fans. Oh, the storytelling, it's so subtle. Bruh, it's not. You can see him. They're focusing on him walking up the ring, but yeah, it is storytelling. There's absolutely no subtlety to this, and that's okay. Wardlow's best sell is the Whisper to the Wind, where I don't think it's intentional, but he falls awkwardly on his leg, and then he just keeps selling on the floor. I think this is Wardlow's best match or second versus his match against Orange Cassidy. So it's Orange Cassidy and then this one. This dude can really use like a performance like this against MJF when the time comes. And it's probably going to come after like one pay-per-view or two. Or hell, even at double or nothing next year. So yeah, number three spot is the doctor spot outside. Number two spot is the finish where Wardlow attempts... A power bomb, but then his leg gives out. It leads to the rear naked choke to the submission win. The TKO win. Or like just the faint submission. And then number one spot is the whisper to the wind cell that I don't think was intentional, but he just ran with it. Honorable mention spot is the leg sweep by Joe that would make Sensei Johnny Lawrence proud. So yeah, this is number two match of the night. It managed to protect Wardlow. It gave us like a taste of his selling. But I think they overdo it in the post-match that I'll talk about after I give the rating. So yeah, pay-per-view undercard match, but they overdo the ending. So yeah, after the match, Joe attacks Wardlow. He cuts off his man bun, which is a terrible haircut. Joe is the biggest babyface for doing this. Darby comes in for the save, but what the hell are you trying to accomplish with having Joe just embarrass Wardlow this way? It points to another match, but I don't want there to be. Joe should just have like a long reign with a TNT title. And that's it. Move Wardlow up. He does not have any business being in this division anymore. So yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Pay-per-view undercard match, really fucking good. Okay, so for the final thoughts on the show, it's the best in-ring dynamite of the year. Very consistent. The women's match does not 
let the card down like it usually does. Or when the women's match is good, the others tend to suck. This one, it's just like consistent all the way through. Segments are a net negative. We just had more stinkers than we had hits on this one. But yeah, it's like an above average dynamite. What matters in AEW is in the ring, and I think that's enough to give this show like maybe a 1 million, a 999, so it would sting. So yeah, Happy New Year. Like, comment, and subscribe for engagement. Share if you don't know me. Hit that bell notification for future videos, and please watch my shit.